really my great pleasure to be here. I've uh, spoken here in this room, I think, about twice uh, when I was a staff scientist at Abroad. And uh, it's, it's always a fun thing to recollect all the memories back at 31 Bini. Um, so the, the title of my talk is uh, In Search of Lost Time. Um, my lab's interests are primarily in uh, chromosome abnormalities. And in general, we want to use cancer genome evolution, especially the evolutionary aspect of cancer genome, cancer development, as a, uh, a test case to study genome evolution in general. Um, so here you can see a few examples of what we normally think about uh, chromosome alterations on the left, or what we generally think of uh, deletion, tandem duplication, inversional translocation kind of events. In the middle is what uh, cytogeneticists used to know about abnormalities in cancer cells. You can see uh, different uh, uh, marker chromosomes and uh, probably generated due to multiple breaks and recombination events. And on the right really shows, I think this is Iran first pointed this out to me, this was uh, a live organoid culture of transformed intestinal stem cells. And you can see, although uh, in comparison to normal, deep, normal cells, diploid cells, where the chromosomes are generally cleanly and evenly segregated into daughter cells, when in, in transformed culture, these cells, the cell divisions usually are accompanied by many really wild abnormalities which could lead to a lot of the uh, complex karyotypic changes we observe in cancer genomes. So part of, my part of the interest in my lab is to try to relate all these different phenomenon, phenomenon and in particular to uh, understand the mechanisms underlying um, the observed pattern of abnormalities. Um, just to start off, when we think about evolution, the first thing we, we generally think about is the tree of life. So if you think about a tree of life, this is very, uh, this is very, I, I think this is very uh, profound. If you think about all the different organisms share a common ancestor dating back to millions of years back. But what we, how we construct the tree of life is we start from what we know at a current stage. So we, we have all the information of different species. We can now sequence most of their genomes. And then we try to go back in time and infer what happened in the past. For example, if we compare human and mice, um, two very well-known uh, species to us, ideally, we want to, if we want to infer the history of evolution, we, want to, we need to go back in time, let's say from independently from mouse to the common ancestor and from human to the common ancestor. Presumably, the evolutionary path from the common ancestor to human and the mice differ because of different environmental exposure, because of different other factors that we don't know. But in reality, we cannot do that because we can't go backward in time. So instead, what we are doing is we just compare the human and the mouse genome or other phenotypes. For the most part, we can only compare the human and the mouse genome. And this is what you get if you compare the human and the mouse genome naively. You see this, um, uh, this is the, on the left is the synthetic map of the human chromosome. If you map the human chromosome um, to the mouse genome and uh, try to uh, demarcate the uh, segments of human genome where the order of genes are preserved between human and mice. This is sort of the, 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 uh, the uh, different segments preserved between human and mouse. It tells you like as if the human chromosomes have been shattered in some way and then restitched together. Presumably this, this happened over many rounds of uh, genomic uh, rearrangements or other kind of mutations. Um, but it, we can come up with a parsimonious explanation for why this happened, but we won't be able to really experimentally test it or validate it or because we can't go, go back in time and we, we, we don't have the history to, to reconstruct this. By contrast, in tumor evolution, we have one key advantage, which is we know both the beginning and the end point of this evolution. So we know that uh, um, in tu during tumor genesis, at least the model we believe in now is tumor cells initially start from, um, tumor develops initially starting from a normal diploid cell, presumably in the progenitor or a stem cell niche. The cell gradually accumulates mutations that allow it to gain proliferative advantage over the other cells and starts um, rounds of 
clonal expansion, and eventually, when the disease was detected, we can we usually see this multi-clonal picture of the. Um, um, oh, by the way, this is a pointer, right? Let's see. Um, I don't know what is the. Oh, this is a, yeah. So by the time we sample the the, the, the final tumor, we can see this mixture of uh, of different clones. And some of them would share different mutations that represent what happened in the progenitor cell. And there will be also differential features between different clones. So this provides an interesting system to me to both, pro to both probe the evolutionary pattern in the genome space. And furthermore, if we think about it, we could even sample the, 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 sample the tumor at different stages of the disease and characterize the phenotypic uh, effects of the different genetic mutations, for example, by uh, approaches like single cell RNA-seq or RNA-seq, we can monitor genome evolution and the phenotypic evolution in the, during the course of tumor development. So today's focus um, of my talk is about genome evolution or chromosomal evolution. So we think about genome evolution in the following way. We start from a diploid uh, genome, all the cells in the human look like this. But then when we look at a tumor genome, this is what you get. I just, I, I picked four different examples. Um, they actually tell us some interesting features about how the cell, a diploid cell, can evolve into different tumors. First of all, you notice there's a wide range of chromosomal copy numbers. You, we have the, uh, a very peculiar case of a near haploid genome. Um, this is a CML uh, a genome with, um, characterized by the uh, Philadelphia chromosome or BCR ABO fusion between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. The other three are all colorectal cancer genomes, and they also have different features. For example, this, this tumor, uh, this genome looks more, on average, a triploid genome. This is uh, more like a hexaploid genome with an average, uh, average number of chromosomes around 127. Uh, this genome is mostly diploid, but it has a lot of structural abnormalities as uh, manifested by the different uh, recombination events between different chromosomes. So I like to think of this, this problem, which is to understand how the cancer genome developed from its, its ancestor, which is the diploid genome, as the following. So we, have, we start with we can compile this vocabulary or the list of alterations that we, we can see from all different cancer genomes. This includes, for example, chromosomal copy number changes that we know can be caused by misaggregation event of single chromosomes, structural alterations of chromosomes, mostly due to translocations, presumably generated by DNA breakage and recombination, and finally, a more profound change um, usually known as whole genome duplication or tetrapoidization is when the cell uh, in G2 phase failed cytokinesis, so the genomic content doubled itself. Now, this I would like to refer as the vocabulary of uh, this, this whole game, but the, when, the cancer, when the genome evolves, it has to obey certain constraints. So this I, I used, I, I think a good analogy for this would be it has to follow certain grammar. So certain, the first thing that um, uh, the, the a stable chromosome has to have a, uh, a, a the, the sort of given configuration with one centromere, which allow the chromosome to segregate evenly to the daughter cells, and either capped by two telomeres at the end, so that the chromosome doesn't fuse, or it form a ring chromosome when it doesn't need the telomere. Because the cell doesn't like DNA double strand breaks, uh, that's a really toxic um, DNA damage, and, and uh, the, the human um, the mammalian cells have evolved in many different ways to cope with that. So there shouldn't be any naked break ends of the DNA. If you construct a genome and then there's a naked break end of DNA unprotected, usually that means something is missing. That, that wouldn't, the cell would not allow that to persist for, modern, uh, for, for more generations. And finally, there's the viability and the selective uh, factor of the constraint. For example, um, most chromosomes contain essential genes that if you have a homozygous loss of one chromosome, you would not um, be able to, the cell likely would not be able to survive. So these are the, the constraints. So 
if we, if we phrase the problem in that way, then essentially I think, this is, I think of this as an anagram puzzle. So we know this is the, uh, the, original, um, the original genome, and we can, in fact, catalog individual alterations that you see in the final genome. This I would think of as the, the individual words or alphabet. But then you want to figure out what is the sentence that this, this puzzle is telling us. And that sentence has to obey certain grammar, which is stable configuration of the chromosomes, as well as the different, um, um, different individual steps or different allowed words that uh, can make this happen. One thing that I didn't mention, but turns out to be extremely important, is the parsimony argument. In this case, I, I, only hit, I, I use only one uh, basic assumption, which is the same locus is not hit twice during genome evolution, meaning if you generate a break at one point to one chromosome, you're unlikely to hit the same locus twice because the genome is big. So that we're going to uh, relate later, later on why this, uh, this has actually become a very powerful um, assumption when it comes to generating a longer linkage of uh, chrom rearranged chromosomes. What makes cancer genome what was more interesting and more complicated is this many different um, types of complex rearrangement events. Um, this, I'm just listing the ones that we think we know uh, uh, the a mechanism for. This include the breakage fusion bridge cycles. We're going to get into detail. Chromothripsis, Iran mentioned, um, it's, this is peculiar phenomenon that uh, one region of the chromosome seems, one region of the genome or part of a chromosome seems to have been fragmented and then recombined in random ways, including uh, recombination with distal regions in the genome. Chromoanathensis, uh, hypothesized to be uh, generated by a series of template switching and replication uh, based uh, mechanism for generating copy number loss and amplification. Chromoplexy, um, first uh, discovered and reported in uh, uh, Levi Garowitz's lab, um, proposed to be a mechanism that uh, 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 multiple DNA double strand breaks were uh, incorrectly joined in a braid like pattern. So I would like to think of this complex rearrangement clusters as sort of phrases that you can generate from the different words, but then they also have to satisfy the constraints that we listed before. In fact, one of the, uh, the, the primary um, mechanism that we, uh, the, the, the major argument for chromothripsis being a one-off event as opposed to multiple sequential event was derived based on the assumption and the constraint that I listed before, which is if all of these events were to be generated sequentially by individual event, it would have been really difficult to both maintain a stable configuration of the chromosome throughout the whole evolutionary process, as well as satisfy the other constraint. So the um, focus of today's talk will be just about this single cancer cell line, which is a breast cancer cell line. Um, this is the HCC 1954 that I've been working on since the day I started at abroad. Uh, this is a uh, hypertetrapoid cell line. You can see the average chromosome number is between four and five. Um, we have done, early on, we have done a lot of uh, uh, characterization of this cell line using shotgun sequencing. So that gives us sort of this local view of the, both the chromosome rearrangements. Here, each, each curve uh, links to diff distal loci in the genome as manifesting as a rearrangement, as well as the copy number alterations. So here you can see the different copy number states in different regions of the uh, genome. Um, early on, when I was uh, working in Matthew's lab, um, we tried to e exploit this nature, which is the segmental copy number changes and the aberrant junctions manifested at chromosomal rearrangements or translocations. They're really the same thing because the boundary of copy number segment segmental changes usually uh, correspond to the aberrant junctions. So we use that feature and uh, refined our detection of copy number breakpoints and rearrangement breaks. And that led us to conclude there's about 1,300 rearrangements in this cancer's, in this cancer's uh, genome. There's about 500 copy number, different copy number segments exceeding 5 kb. So I, I think of this 
as the vocabulary that we try to uh, reconstruct now into complete sentences from this genome. So the question becomes, how do we utilize the two sources of information, copy number, aberrant junctions, and try to derive structures of rearranged chromosomes? Um, one thing that is, we're, is missing from the, the description of the genomic alterations is we usually think of uh, uh, genome alterations in this sort of haploid view where we just overlay all the mutations onto a single haploid representation of both the maternal and the paternal chromat uh, maternal and the paternal haplotype. So this is um, how we usually think of this. But really, there are two different scenarios. You could have the two mutations in the same chromatid or in different chromosomes. In this case, this, if, the, if the mutation represents translocations, this will give us very different configurations of the rearranged chromosome. In other words, you can think about if Rick and I, we're speaking at the same time, you know the, you know the words that we are speaking, but you don't know which one is speaking which, and you just take the transcript, it's going to be harder for you to figure out each of us, what each of us is speaking. But whereas if you know the words that he's speaking and the words I'm speaking, then that makes it more straightforward to or make it at least a simple problem, easier problem to figure out what each of us are speaking. So just to give you an example, this is the spectral karyotype of the haploid representation mutations. This is what we usually know. If we can generate this diploid representation, then that would give us a lot more information to trace out history of how the individual chromatid evolves during course. And to do that, the, cha the challenge essentially becomes two things. One is we need to generate the haplotype information of the germline genome. And using that, we can further generate the somatic haplotype, or in other words, how the mutations in the cancer genome are accumulating on the two uh, homologous chromosomes. And to do that, a powerful technology is using long reads, and that I'm going to hand over to Rick, and he's going to talk primarily about how to generate a germline haplotype. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, the sort of phase, it's called phasing, where you sort of separate haplotypes um, in a long read sample. And the general concept is uh, you have these long reads, and they should span more than one SNP site. So if you just take a bulk average of like the human genome, you have three to the nine bases. Uh, average amount of SNPs is three to the six. You get one SNP per thousand bases. So if Illumina is 100 bases, you're not going to get much um, inf phasing information out of it. Um, so there are various uh, long read technologies I'll talk about in the, in the next slide, but um, they're basically competing to increase this read length. Um, in the case of 10x, it's a BX tag. Um, but you want to increase the span so you can cover more head sites, you have more evidence that things are connected. Um, and I've just shown a um, diagram here. So if, say you have these head sites, and before you sequence, you don't know which is on which haplotype. Um, you can sort of, either by their presence or their absence, you can sort of make inference that these, this is a head site here that has to be connected to a reference base. Or on the other haplotype, there would be a SNP there. And so in that way, you can sort of walk along these long reads and assemble a haplotype. Um, and yes, I'll get to the technologies, which, so there's, well, there may be more, but the three uh, I'm familiar with is 10x, um, PacBio, and Oxford Nanopore. So 10x, the methodology is they have these beads that are, um, have primers on them. You can flow long segments of DNA into the channel, and you sort of tag each long segment. Um, and they, it gets about 100 kilobase long BX read. Um, in the case of PacBio, they have um, a polymerase at the bottom of a well. Um, they add bases, and if the and they, they can sort of count off the bases, um, and this has been shown to work for um, up to 10 k kilobases around there. Um, another exciting technology is Oxford Nanopore, where they have this um, channel in the membrane, and then they uh, record the, the ion passage through the membrane, um, and they can correlate that to each base and sort of have a sequence, a long read sequence. I'll be talking about these two. This is the data I've been using, but th this is a possibility. The 
phasing methodology that I'm developing is supposed to be generic to all of these. So um, it could, in principle, you could use Oxford nanopore. Um, there are previous phasing methods. Um, the one I in mean, 10x has a uh, in-house one. It's called Long Ranger. Um, it's based on a, a paper that uses a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, method. Um, basically, they uh, bin the genome into some amount of bins. They count up the BX tags, relate that to the head sites, and then use, they have this probabilistic model to connect um, neighboring um, bins in the genome. Um, but there are some, well, you lose some information in this way. Um, this long ranger is local by nature. They're looking at sequential haplotype. Um, and uh, in my case, you might want to say you have a bad SNP site. You might want to um, ignore that because it ha gives you confounding information. Um, it does not allow for error correction. Um, and it does not differentiate between sources of error. You could have just a single bad SNP, or you could have um, some combination causing a switching error. Um, it also does not integrate well with other types of data, like um, various, um, like other sorts of copy number data or other sorts of long-range sequencing data. Um, in my method, you can sort of combine everything um, and phase from there. Um, just in general, how it works. So if you look at, this is packed biodata. If you just look in IGV and you look at four close heterozygous sites, you sort by this base, you see that the neighboring heterozygous sites sort of line up, which shows you that, so if they're sorted by read, it shows you that there's this, um, you know, this haplotype is present. Um, so what we want to do is we want to count up evidence for two neighboring haplotypes, or, you know, they can be further apart. Um, so I, I plus one, I plus two, you could sort of jump over I plus one. You could con correlate I with I plus two. But in general, you're, you have two situations it can be in, either reference, reference, which is the same thing as variant, variant, um, or reference, variant. Um, and so you want to assemble a pairwise matrix, which counts up each, uh, each long read or each source of evidence. So just showing this um, in a graphical form. For this case, you would have a variant reference, het site, and so on, and you would sort of connect. Um, so there's a long read which connects these two, and it shows this situation, uh, versus a long read which connects variant, variant, which shows this other situation. Um, ultimately, the haplotype we want to phase is germline, so it's, at this point, you take it as a binary haplotype. It's either variant or reference. Um, and so you can sort of piece together this um, uh, haplotype array, which I'll call spins, but it's just a, a array of if something is either variant or reference. Um, yeah. So more in depth, um, you count up the number of reads that span head sites I and J supporting the reference, 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 or variant, variant, um, or and the in the other case, you count up the number of reads which are reference variant or variant reference. Um, you calculate this fraction, um, which ranges from negative one to one. So if you have more reads which support reference reference, and then so say it's, it's one, that means all of your evidence supports reference reference. Whereas if you have some mix, so say it's a bad heterozygous site, um, you would get this close to zero. Um, you then, we do, we also want to include some level of uh, copy number or some level of um, connection number scaling. So say if you had just one read or two reads which span a head site versus like 100 reads, you would want to be able to penalize the two reads situation. So you add this term here, which is the absolute value of the difference. Um, and so that can sort of scale your evidence uh, matrix. Um, ultimately, you put it in a uh, you, you want to minimize the energy. It looks kind of like a Ising model. In, instead of the J, you have this pairwise matrix. Um, and so if you have two spins which are the same, so this is going to be one. Um, in this case, you would calculate the M. And if they agree, then you, it would be a negative energy. It would be, um, yeah, it would be preferred. Um, 
So how do we solve this matrix? Um, there's various ways to solve it. The one that I'm focusing on is using Monte Carlo. Um, so you simply, if your haplotype is array, an array of spins, you can sort of flip each spin, calculate the difference in energy. Um, the exponential of that is the probability, but you can basically have, for each site, you can give a sort of spin flip um, change in energy and a block flip change in energy. Um, so you can differentiate, differentiate between switching error and base or snip error. So in the case of a flip, uh, spin flip, you just simply invert negative one to one or the other way, um, calculate the change in energy, and you accept if it's negative, uh, if it's the change in energy is negative. Versus a block flip, where you, where you flip everything before site i, and then you, you know, again, calculate the change and accept it. Um, this way you differentiate between the two sources there. You might have a several, you might just have a couple bad reads which support two hats being connected, or you might just have a bad heterozygous site, like a bad variant call. Um, so what this looks like, this is packed biodata. Um, so it's not in genome coordinates, these are just sequential head sites. As you would expect, head sites are not equally spaced on the genome, so you might get clumps of, of uh, these this data, and so you see like maybe there's a clump here, and so there's different clumps of SNP sites. Um, but in, case, in the cases where you don't have information connecting these haplotypes, um, we call that a switching error, or a site of, of you know, lower energy um, for connection, or I mean higher energy <laughs> for connection, so you, you don't have a good, good uh, connection between the head sites. And so the, the uh, in, the haplotype between sources of switching error is called the haplotype block. That's just a, a, a region in the genome where you know the haplotype phase pretty well. So in this case, you can also see a source of error down here. It's kind of, um, you kind of got to look in depth. But you can see this is scaled by the reference variant or re reference reference. Um, so if something is near white, that means you really don't have evidence either way. So in this case down here, we have lighter colors, which means there's some confounding information. But the, um, the idea here is we're not throwing out any um, data. If we jump over that head site, like in, say, in this corner here, we still have data connecting head sites before it and head sites after it. So we can sort of, we don't throw away data. You keep all of it, and you sort of minimize the total energy. So what does this look like? Um, for a certain region in the genome. Um, you can calculate the delta E flip and the delta E of the block flip um, and sort of plot those along the genome. Um, you can relate that to the probability that the site is accurately phased, so it's just one minus the exponential of that. Um, and so there you have a head site specific um, variant call quality, basically. Then you can also, in the same way, you can get the black flip quality, so you know sites where you don't have just that much information because maybe they're far apart or you, there is some other problem. Um, so how does this perform? Um, you can calculate, so you, event, at the end of it you get a sort of a distribution of haplotype block sizes. Um, you sort that by size and you can look at N, the N50 um, in this case, for 10x technology, you get an N50 of about 4.6 megabases. And PacBio, which is smaller read length as well, you get uh, 200 kilobases. And this is at least comparable with Long Ranger. It depends on how deep you sequence, but um, yeah. Th this is in the, in the ballpark of, of what they find in their method. So, what can this give you in terms of looking at genome evolution or just looking at um, genomic information in higher, higher definition? So this is just, so if you simply just take the variant calls from um, GATK and you get copy number for each variant and you just plot them on some, on the, uh, like across the genome, in this case it's 3P, um, you can see that you get for it, for our cancer, we have a copy number asymmetry in chromosome 3, so we can see two um, sort of states of, of copy number with each variant. Um, 
But we, we, so this way we can sort of pick out a subset of those head sites just from raw copy number and say that that's probably a, a haplotype um, in this sample. Can you describe the axis of the plot, or the third of So this is, this is, um, basically you look in GATK and you look, I mean, you look at the VCF and you look at the two head sites coverage. Um, and then, you, then I just call the one that's above, I call that orange, right? So I don't know for sure, like in the middle, you don't have a good idea which is which, but in the case of, if you just plot the histogram, you see two general peaks, and you can sort of say this one, this subset here is probably, you know, the uh, one allele that has like three copies in this case. So, so you're looking at a cancer where there are copy number changes in order to test whether you're right. Right. Your, your yeah, and that's the next slide, well, after this. But you want, you want something to, art to compare to. I mean, we would like to have uh, chromosomes separated. I mean, there's, we're looking at ways to sort of mechanically separate chromosomes so you can have a, a very clean uh, truth set. But this is one way to just test your algorithm, see if it's um, performing accurately. Um, but, so if you just compare the technologies before I get to the accuracy, you can see that the PacBio, uh, PacBio just has, in general has smaller block sizes because the reads are shorter. Um, and in, in the case of this is chromosome three, there is a copy number asymmetry. So you can see you generally can condense this sort of data down to something a little more clean, which um, so each block here, I'm just taking the average um, copy number for each heterozygous site. And if I call it a block, that means I don't phase with any copy number. It's, it's pure linked reads. So, um, so within a block, it's, there is no like, copy number phasing. But you can, you can probably tell. You could say, okay, this is probably a chromosome, uh, like one parental chromosome. Um, so, uh, getting back to like, how do we test for accuracy? Um, so, since we have this copy number um, subset that we faced, and we can compare it to the blocks that we we get from um, this sort of the other sort of linked read phasing, um, you can see that you can calculate the fraction which are incorrect. So it goes from zero to 0.5, which is, 0.5 is a coin flip. You have no idea, basically, um, which is right. Um, so for PacBio and 10x, you see that most of them um, have, most of the blocks have a low fraction that's incorrect. Um, in the case of 10x, there is some problems, which I'll get into, where there is some blocks which have a higher fraction that's incorrect. But if you go back and you look at, okay, if they're incorrect, what are the sizes of them? Like maybe it's all just the small ones, and it's just confined to regions where there's conflicting information. You can see, um, in this case, I sort by the size of the haplotype block or the number of hats, um, and I sort of have a histogram of, you know, the number of blocks in each bin, and then you also can color by the correct, like how correct they are. So basically, by seeing all these um, sort of, this is a coin flip down here, by seeing all this um, sort of poor quality information at low block sizes, that sort of shows you that, um, you know, it, that all the, uh, there must be a few like sort of mistaked regions, but they're confined to small blocks. Um, so this is just a comparison once again. So you, this is what you start off in a v, VCF versus if you phase with uh, long reads, in this case 10x, you can get something like this. I point to this, this is a, could be a switching error. Um, and uh, that, I've looked into the, data, the 10x data. There is uh, one sort of, um, due to the 10x methodology, there's some sort of noise in the background. This might be because some beads uh, sort of get um, mixed or some small segments of DNA get mixed on multiple beads. Um, but if you just plot the um, uh, unique BX tags between any two bins in the genome, you can get a matrix that kind of looks like this. As you would expect, there is a unique BX tag sort of backbone to the genome. 
if you just tile the, the 10x reads, you would, you would expect to see something like this. But there is also some off-diagonal noise. So this, to me, seems like some sort of you know, methodology error that's um, providing some noise. I don't know exactly what is causing it. But you've got to be aware that there is going to be some switching error due to this um, sort of off-diagonal uh, um, high seek, I think. Uh, we have it, but in principle, you could bring the high seek information to the same matrix. No, high seek. Like high seek. So there's this thing with pattern closer. And, um, like in general, there's a problem with pattern closer. Uh, I don't know. This we just use their published, uh, their public data set. So yeah. This right. is actually one of the earlier runs, so we don't know. It's sort of like a question of how much of an issue it is. It's sort of like causes barcode. Right. Yeah, so in this, so the way we define blocks is you define a cutoff, just basically some energy which below you're saying those are blocks and above you're saying that's noise. Um, so if you, as you increase the cutoff or move it down, you're basically gaining accuracy in the blocks, but you're also splitting up the longest block. So in this case, this is obviously full of switching errors because we have a low cutoff. But as you increase the cutoff, you can sort of clean up the data. You get higher accuracy. Um, but up to a certain point, it becomes you're just cutting up blocks and making the, the data sort of, uh, it's slightly, it's like 9.99 .99 versus, you know, one. <laughs> so it's a trade-off. Um, but ultimately, what can this give us? If you have a little copy number, um, you can better delineate um, each chromosome state. So say you have something like this, where you have the sequence of the whole genome, you have some copy number histogram, you have some peaks. Whereas if you have the allylic copy number, you can sort of look at per chromosome uh, what seems to be the copy number state. In some of these rearranged chromosomes, you have multiple copy number states because they get um, either get you know rearranged and then duplicated or stuff like that. Um, but you start to see peaks which you can relate to, okay, this might be one copy, num one copy and then you have two, three, and four. Um, there is some, so this is, we're improving this, but there is some uh, lower, so that in this case, chromosome one, you see there's like a lower state. Um, we think that's something related to a subclonal sort of, because you sequence a clone, it might be like there's differences between the clone. So th we think this, um, state might be a subclonal like loss of chromosome one. Um, so there's things to think about with um, these sorts of s sequencing methods. Yeah, just want to make sure I understand the plot on the right. So yeah. What are we asking? The, the sort of bottom axis. So this is coverage. Um, in this case, we're using PacBio P read coverage, which is somewhat better at copy number. So we have the haplotypes. You can then assign copy number from any sequencing. We can use PCR free, you can use Illumina, whatever uh, is the best source. We're using P read coverage, so it's lower in general, um, but it should be more consistent. Um, and then you're looking at just over a whole chromosome, and you say, okay, there's a haplotype block. Uh, what is the average copy number of that haplotype block? Yeah. Um, yeah. Does that also have the copy number variation in there? Is it kind of a binary? So there is some, like, so say you had three chromosomes versus one in a cancer. There is going to be some copy number bias in the data because you just have more information on the three chromosomes that you sequence. Um, but, like, as, as far as if you can see it in the matrix, is that what you're asking? Right. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen a clear, like, like jump yet. Yeah, I guess the other question is this one chromosome or is it the two maternal paternal um, shown together? Or just so the idea is that, okay, so in this case it's total coverage. So maybe there's, so there's some state at 10 which could be two chromosomes and that could be one or it could be one and three if this is the HCC which we think it's one and then three of another haplotype. But then you can look at fraction like, you know, 
one out of four or, so, or something like that. I guess my question is, like, you see these kind of X shapes off the diagonal here? Right. What, what does that mean? So that could be a small duplication, I feel. Uh, there's some, I mean, I'll, I've looked into this. I, I think there's, there's differences between, this is all mapped to H238. We're working on a cell line specific reference. And there are some small differences that could cause like sort of, um, you know, matrices like this, just bumps in the, in the signal. Um, and there is clear, so I don't, I don't have it here in this presentation, but there's clear evidence in the matrix you can see for like rearrangements and, you know, long range tandem duplications or um, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, so just in conclusion for my section and then I'll hand it back to Susie. Um, we wanted to create a, gen a general way to phase um, any long read technology. I mean, a lot of these other methods use some sort of probabilistic model and is very focused on their method or their sequencing. Um, but this, this method, you can combine all long range information into one matrix, solve it, and that gives you pretty accurate um, haplotype blocks, which you can then clean up the genome. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to CZ. Yeah, we'll take questions. Oh, yeah. I have a question. So you showed that uh, with specific bioscience, you get haplotypes of about 200 GB with 10x, maybe 4 megabases. Yeah, right. Now, my feeling is that if you do the same exercise just using population-based phasing, you're going to get something on the order of 1 megabyte phase. And um, so that's, there's still a lot of population information there that can help you. Did you try to integrate the two? Um, so I, I believe, yeah, there is uh, certainly, uh, it can definitely inform. I think population haplotype phasing is definitely useful um, for these sorts of studies. I mean, with these cancer cell lines, there's a lot of rearrangements. So, I mean, you're using population statistics. When there's rearrangements, it gets sort of, um, I don't know, it's like, you're still rearranging starting from a model where it was deployed. Uh, so right. Then become tetraploid yeah, if you have the normal, haplotypes. if you have the normal haplotype phase, then definitely that helps. Um, um, but as, as far as looking at um, specific rearrangements, um, you would want some like pure sequencing evidence. I think this could be one way to look at that. So, okay, I think uh, in general, you could, we should incorporate the population, by, uh, the population phasing data as well. You can think of the population phasing as a probabilistic matrix for the linkage between different sites. And the idea is you could bring in any kind of linkage information to the matrix and then just do a simple optimization problem. And uh, you can, you know, we can tune the parameters to compute the likelihood for, uh, to, 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 to adjust different weights for the different kinds of information. And uh, we can use, for example, high C data as well for a given, uh, a given cell line. Even the high C data is sparse, but you get some long range scaffold information. But the, the main idea is we want to be able to integrate different sources of information and uh, weigh their statistical evidence accordingly, and then have a way to, uh, to jointly infer the haplotype. And uh, I think another important feature is we do want to distinguish between switching error, which is a single block f flip, and uh, just the incorrectly phased, uh, geno uh, in incorrectly phased genotype. Because when we're doing copy number analysis, you want to do the homologous, you want to do the allelic copy number, a switching error would really give a lot of headache to us. Even though for phasing, you, you, let's say you phase 10 megabase, you have one switching error, that could be a, a big problem if we do the copy number, because that totally changes the uh, allelic copy number states. So this is the other uh, reason that we want to implement this to, to be able to control for both of that. Okay. So, uh, question? Yeah. I don't want to be too technical, sure. but uh, I wonder about this issue. Sometimes in the genome, you have some regions that might be germline copy number free. Uh -huh. so one has two copies and the other one has one, and uh -huh. the reference uh, is yeah. only one copy. Yeah. And, uh, and so now you have three haplotypes, and then you try to put a matrix uh, mm -hmm. the models, uh, a diploid model by your triploid. Does that break things? And then my other question is, at the edges of these 10x blocks and 5 bio blocks, what actually causes 
the switch uh, error to be there? Have you looked into that? What are the typical error modes? Most of it's just because there's just a gap of like hats. So there's a long, in the case of PacBio, it's 10 KB. So that's, you're going to have just a lot of empty areas if you don't have hats along there. Um, but there are some other cases where there's just a bad reference. I mean, there's just a bunch of poorly, I mean, they're not horribly mapped, but they're just not, you know, in incredibly well mapped reads. So. And uh, I think for what you mentioned, assuming there is a large segmental duplicated region um, that could actually make the local copy number stays instead of two, but three, but then the additional allele could actually join incorrectly to something else. So that could cause a problem in, in terms of phasing. So um, that's something we haven't yet fully looked into. I guess I would bet the majority of the phasing errors when we have substantial evidence from the linkage but does not give consistent copy number is because of that kind of uh, germline, um, I call it incompleteness of the reference genome. Okay, good. So, um, so Rick just uh, described the work on the, uh, the germline haplotype phasing. Now, now I'm going to give you some of more recent work uh, still in progress about how we construct the structure of the rearranged chromosomes and try to infer the history of evolution. So this I, I can generally refer to as somatic haplotype phasing. So I'll give you a few examples. I, actually, today, for, in the interest of time, I only have two examples. So first, let's take a look at, oh, for that reason, this is not working. Um, okay. What? Uh, okay. Good. So um, the first example I want to talk about is chromosome 8. So this is the copy number state of chromosome 8. You can already see there's a lot of events going on, a lot of activity, and not to mention this really busy uh, region in chromosome 8. I'm not going to go to that part yet. Let's focus on the P arm of chromosome 8. So uh, this is sort of the normalized the copy number state. So you can see a P arm has a lower copy number state than the Q arm in general, but there is this pr uh, prominent peak near the central mirror. Um, when we zoom into this region and look at translocations or, or rearrangements, we see this, this pattern of two, uh, the region, the amplified region is flanked by two sort of fold back inversions. You can think of this as a sequence is directly uh, fused to its uh, the same sequence, but in an inverted orientation. And then there, in the middle, there was a uh, interchromosomal translocation to chromosome 12. So this fallback inversion is the hallmark of this process known as breakage fusion bridge cycles. So the bridge, the breakage fusion bridge cycles was first de described uh, in the in the 30s, uh, well before the. Um, uh, discovery of telomere, uh, the, the, uh, well before the, the discovery of what telomere does to the cell. So this is purely based on observation of uh, 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 post-meiotic uh, mitosis of uh, microspores in, in, in the corn, corn ears. So you can see this is like uh, two uh, cells, uh, two chromatin mass connected by a bridge. And uh, on here, uh, the, the bridge is broken. This, this is a more condensed uh, nucleus with this, this dangling end, and this is the other uh, chromatin mass. Um, how it happened is when there's a single broken end in the cell, this broken end, because the cell doesn't like naked broken end, um, and it's not capped by telomere, so it would try to fuse with any other uh, naked end of DNA just by all kinds of uh, recombination mechanism. And because there's only a single broken end, the only way, the only end it can fuse to is its sister chromatin after DNA replication. But that creates a problem when there's a dissect, basically the two central mirrors are not linked in a single chromatid. And then at mitosis, this dicentric chromosome, the two central mirrors are being pulled into opposite cells that has to be resolved most likely uh, into in, in new break. And uh, that break causes actually two uh, broken ends or naked ends in each of the two daughter cells. And this vicious cycle just keeps going on and on. Um, schematically, um, in, in mammalian cells, usually this started from a telomere fusion due to telomere attrition, causes this dicentric chromosome has to be resolved, cause a new break, and then the two daughter cells would fuse the two broken ends and then that eventually would grow and grow and into this um, breakage fusion bridge cycles. So you can see two features. First of all, after the breakage, let's say look at this daughter cell that they have lost this segment. 
So presumably that should be accompanied by loss of heterozygosity. And second of all, um, this cycle is, is keep go, keeps going until this end is being captured or being capped by some segment with a telomere. So that has to occur to conclude this thing. So the question is, did BFB lead to chromosome 8P loss in the previous figure? So this is the view that if we have the allelic copy number, this is what we get for the coverage in chromosome 8P. Again, here are the two colors. I didn't use the haplotype information yet. The two colors just showing the two uh, alleles uh, coverage uh, binned by 1KB and only looking at the heterozygous sites. But there's already very obvious patterns. So for example, the magenta allele is on 8P arm is only the magenta allele, and, eight, and uh, the, the green, which is the other allele, essentially is all lost on 8P. So there is lost heterozygosity on the 8P. Um, but then for the green allele, it actually, the loss didn't stop at a centromere. The loss persisted till the Q arm. That means this loss on here on the P arm due to the breakage fusion bridge cycle only occurred to the magenta allele, but not to the green allele. In fact, uh, we could even, even though the, the, agenda, the magenta here and the magenta here, we didn't have direct linkage information from the haplotype. We could validate that, but because the other allele is consistently lost by the parsimony, um, we have to, we, we would assume the two uh, segments with both a non-zero copy number state, they're, they're not lost, they must have been in phase. Because if, it's, if it, the other was the case, that means this part of the segment goes to zero, and this part of the segment goes to a high copy number state. That, that, in order to have that happening, you would have to invoke the, the same break occurring to both homologs, and that's something we discussed. The parsimony forbids that. If there's a single break, that has to occur to one allele, but not to both. And because we have the, we have two, uh, we have the, so, so in the single break, there should be only one copy number change. And because the green or the low copy number state, the, the low, low copy number allele has consistently zero copy, this change has to occur in the other allele that has non-zero copy number state. Is that clear? It's tricky. Um, so by that argument, we figure that for the allele A, which is the magenta allele, there is, breakage fusion bridge cycle led to leading to the loss of the P arm. And we can further even evaluate the copy number difference between the Q arm and the P arm. That difference is actually two. So let, that led us to infer that after the amplification and breakage fusion bridge cycles, this, there is a further duplication, presumably accompanying uh, the whole genome duplication of the cell. Um, you also see this wild focal amplifications on the Q arm. Now, in the Q arm, we again saw two copy number state. There's a one copy number state, and there is something around four copy number state, and this high level amplification of mass. By the same argument that both homologs cannot break at the same place, you would infer the parsimonious explanation is the four copy number four state corresponds to a given allele, whereas the other copy number states come from the other allele. So for that, we infer that actually this amplified region presumably was in the same chromatid or same haplotype as the one that, had, that was lost in the P arm. So what we think was happening here is for allele A, there is breakage fusion bridge cycles followed by whole, genome, whole chromosome duplication that, caused, that explained the difference between the Q arm level copy number and P arm. Whereas for allele B, there was chromothripsis that led to loss of the central mirror. And presumably the, the, the retained fragment that wasn't lost fused to chromosome 5 because there was extensive rearrangement between 8 and 5. And that fusion may have led to something like a ring chromosome underwent rounds of amplification and potentially chromothripsis may, and may include even breakage fusion bridge cycles that lead to this complex amplicon in 8 arm, including MIC. So that is what we think is happening to chromosome 8. In the second snippet, I want to discuss what happens to chromosome 17. Okay, maybe five minutes. <laughs> if people can, if people can leave. I think we have five minutes if, if possible. Yeah. So uh, we will conclude this part really quickly. So 
Um, so chromosome 17 has this focal amplification, which is on the, uh, 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 which includes the RB2, uh, the HER2 amplicon. This has a very high level amplification. Um, if you look at the RB2 amplicon, this is the copy number state, and if you look, if you, we overlay the rearrangements on top of this, we see a bunch of foldback inversions flanking this amplicon and also interspersed in the middle with the interchromosomal translocation. So that again led us to think that this is presumably a breakage fusion bridge cycle kind of mechanism leading to the amplification. But remember, the breakage fusion bridge cycle would, would imply there's loss of heterozygosity on either of this region, uh, the flanking regions, if there was a telomeric loss. But when we look at the copy number, there is no loss of heterozygosity on either flanking region. So that tells us something is missing. So this is a busy figure, so um, after this we'll, we'll conclude. Uh, we were, again were able to generate allelic copy number for the two, uh, uh, for the two uh, alleles. Magenta would be one, magenta correspond to one allele and green correspond to the other allele. Now, what is remarkable is the, the magenta allele is consistent at four copies. Um, the green allele has two different copy number states, one at about one copy, the other at about three copy. And then they were all intertwined by rearrangements, sort of joining these different fragments together. So the three copy number states were joined to the three copy number states, single copy number states were joined to the single copy number segments. And then there were additional foldback inversions, and the amplicon is right over here, which is flanked by uh, uh, some three copy number um, states. So one clue that we get is from this interchromosomal translocation. Remember, there was a, a, a translocation to chromosome 12. So we follow this translocation and figure out where it went to. So indeed, it went to the 12P arm near the, tel near the, near the P telomeres end. And uh, so that presumably was the conclusive event for the BFB. Remember, it has to conclude by being capped by something that has a telomere. So this is presumably what happened. Um, that capped the breakage fusion bridge cycle. But even though we can't infer directly how many copies of the BFB chromatid was, we can count it from the end where it was fused to. And in here, we counted that actually there were three copies of the telomere segment that was fused to the growing BFB. So that led us to infer that there were three copies of the BFB amplicon, which exactly agrees with this three copy of the rearranged chromatid. So what we think was happening in chromosome 17 was there was a chromosome 17 being fragmented, leading to 7P loss and massive rearrangement of the 7Q arm, presumably juxtaposing the amplicon to the central mirror and causing BFB of that amplicon. BFB of the amplicon was further uh, captured by the 12P telomere and then amplified three times. So we infer this has to occur most likely after whole genome duplication because the fragmentation of the 17 led to both the single copy uh, fragments and the three copy fragments. Because of their single copy fragments, that has to be occurring after whole genome duplication. And uh, in fact, there was early uh, cytogenetic studies showing that there were two different uh, uh, segments of containing the RB2 homologous staining regions, one here and then one here. This presumably reflects a isochromosome that uh, uh, capped by both, uh, uh, both capped by chromosome 12 telomere. So um, I'm going to skip this and then just quickly summarize. Um, I think what we have learned from just analyzing this single genome is a large number of rearrangements in cancer were actually generated by breakage fusion bridge cycles and chromosomes possibly linked with each other. And I, was, I would regard this two as some common phrases spoken by the cancer genome. And uh, I think we can really make a good sense of the cancer genomes if we put on the constraint that we learn from molecular biology and combine that with experimental analysis. With that, I would conclude and take any more questions.